Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. This is going to be my last video of my Christmas week cases. As any of you know who actually celebrate it, Christmas is tomorrow. The case that I'm going to be looking into today is the unsolved murder of Emily Meng. This case was a suggested case by Sarah, so thank you for that. I appreciate any suggestions you guys have. I'd just like to let you know, I mean no disrespect to anyone I'm going to talk about. I've just gathered this information off the internet and compiled it into a video for educational purposes. Please let me just say, if I pronounce any of these names of places or people wrong, I am so sorry, I apologise profusely, but I really found them quite hard to pronounce, so yeah, just bear with me on that one. Located in the west coast of Denmark, Kossa is a small town of just 14,000 people, and it kind of has a rising amount of tourists visiting the town each year, but darkness does linger over this town, with the unsolved murder of Emily Meng in 2016. It still haunts the town and, well, the nation, really. The thing is, Kossa is a very small town and it was always really known as a pretty safe place to live. And not only that, it was pretty rare that murders went unsolved in Denmark. And this senseless murder of a regular Danish teenager truly just shocked the nation. Emily Anin Skobad Meng was born on the 31st of July in 1998 in Corsa, Denmark, to parents Helena Meng and Nikolai Skogo. She lived with her mother and stepfather Jesper, and she was only 17 years old when she vanished. Unfortunately, her body would be found five months later on Christmas Eve. I know that the immediate case didn't actually happen around Christmas, but that was when her body was discovered, and that's why I've included it in kind of this Christmas week list, because the family would have been getting as ready as they possibly could for Christmas with their daughter being missing and then they found a body and I'm sure it would have just totally destroyed them. Let me take you through the details of the case, of this case in the hopes that somebody out there knows something. Maybe somebody has the key to solving this case and they just don't know it yet. It was on the 10th of July in 2016 when Emily was last seen. She'd been on this city trip with her friends to a town called Sleusa and it was kind of just from the east where she lived. And that's where they will be celebrating that night. Emily and her four friends were all having fun. They were all really looking forward to what they described was going to be the best summer. Unfortunately, one of them wouldn't reach the summer. So they'd all gone out over there to celebrate how successful they'd been in these end of year exams that they took. And that marks the end of their first year at Sleusa Gymnasium. They had gotten their school diplomas. They all went out and had a really good time. They enjoyed themselves. And the atmosphere on the night was described by friends as jubilant. They also stopped before they came home at a cafe and they went to a McDonald's restaurant too. All the girls that were together that night were described as being very well mannered and respectful as well as being really kind. During the night in question, there was no real reason to believe that drugs sort of took any part in the night at all or even in Emily's outside life, she wasn't believed to have had that in her life at all. This kind of euphoric atmosphere did change whilst they were at McDonald's though because Emily had actually been seeing this boy and he sent her a Facebook message while she was at this McDonald's ending their relationship. They weren't really an official couple but it's believed that Emily really liked him. They were just getting closer and closer and then suddenly after enjoying the night out, he ended it and she was rightly upset. So after they finished at this fast food restaurant, they jumped on a train from Sleusa station to Corsa train station. They had a taxi waiting there as they got off the train, which they had pre-booked. Whilst on the train journey, Emily's battery was very low on her phone and so she ended up charging it, basically as long as she could while she was on this train. The entire trip took only around nine minutes. The train pulled into the station at 3.53 a.m. Now this is when the girls tried to convince Emily to get in the taxi with them. At first I believe she was unsure what to do but eventually she decided that she was going to walk the 2.5 miles home. Her family's house was located in Central Corsa. It was only two miles away from the station and it was just this short walk down this kind of gravel path which wouldn't have taken her very long and so that was why she decided to walk home alone. That's just an awful because she said her goodbyes to her friends 
and that was the last time they saw her alive again. At around 4am, Emily sets off. She carries on texting her friends up until her phone either dies or is physically turned off. And that was the last sign of Emily. She was never heard of or seen again. In the last text that came through, she told her friends that she intended to take this road past some allotments and go onto a small street between the station and the highway. A friend of Emily's called Nicole said, we drove past her in the taxi. The last thing we see is her walking on the path. I think nothing's gonna happen. It's Corsair. Almost nothing happened to you. And the really, really sad thing was that she, it wouldn't have taken her long to get home, but she never made it home. Even though the journey was so short, clearly there was somebody out that night, a predator or I don't know, and somebody targeted her. Her family woke in the morning to find Emily wasn't home and obviously they got worried. Later on, she was supposed to sing at the local St. Paul's Church's choir. And so her mother made her way there, hoping that she would be there. And that was when she found out that she'd actually missed the 9.30 practice. And that was said to be very out of character for Emily. And Helena went on to try and find her. When she couldn't, she called the police and reported her as missing. Later that same day, her family went on the media to make appeals for Emily's safe return home. The police launched this huge investigation and on the 11th of July, they brought in dogs, divers, horseback units, helicopters, along with over 200 volunteers all to search for Emily. Unfortunately, the search with the helicopter did have to be stopped because the weather was really bad, the rain was really bad, and either they couldn't see anything or it was just too dangerous to carry on. But they carried on the ground searches. The police did actually think that it was possible that she could have run away, that she was very upset and sad by the breakup, obviously, with this boy. And previously, she had actually fled to Copenhagen without telling anyone, and it was several hours before she actually contacted anyone. So this theory that was backed up by one of her friends could have been plausible. At around noon, another helicopter was sent out and around about 90 volunteers this time to search the ground. There seemed to be these rumours floating around that Emily was alive and that she'd been active on Facebook and seen some of the messages that people were being sent to her. And this was a couple of days after she'd gone missing, but the police quickly ruled out that as kind of evidence to say that she was still alive. They continued their search over the coming days. The family set up a reward for her safe return. I believe it was around 200,000. So members of the public come forward and some of them say that they believe that they've seen someone that looks like Emily on the Halskov bridge. But they looked into this and unfortunately it turned out that it wasn't Emily. At this point the search, the police have searched everywhere that they could. They've searched down all the footpaths leading to town. The harbour, all the possible routes that Emily could have taken sort of to get from the station to her house. They searched with the helicopter over the Greenbelt lands, streams, lakes, along with all these teams of divers searching the water. But they just couldn't find anything. Emily was seemingly nowhere. They looked into surveillance tapes around the train stations and they found two potential witnesses. These men were actually found and they were interviewed, but unfortunately they didn't see anything of value. By the 16th of July, the hope was kind of fading that Emily would be found alive and well. As you probably know, the sooner that they find them, the better, which is why they try and pull out all the stops and get this person found, because the longer it goes on, the more likely they're not going to be found alive, unfortunately. Regardless of that, there were so many searches done, so many volunteers helping any way they could. They were doing anything to find her. More tips came in, but they proved to not be related. They also had a tip about a black bag that was thought to be Emily's, when they finally looked in, found this and looked into it, they realised that it wasn't hers. On the 22nd of July, they began investigating the train tracks in between the two stations because somebody had been walking the dog along there and the dog had come back with blood around its snout and on its paws. Now, of course, that could have literally been anything. Could have been an animal, could have been anything, but they're looking for a missing woman. And so they look into it, but they didn't find anything. A group of volunteers, also found this black sort of top that was thought to be similar to what Emily were wearing but that was proved to not be Emily's and not related to the case also. Police found some items around about where she went missing but the police did refuse to comment on these so I don't know whether they were related to a case or not but they didn't comment on them either way. In early October the local people in the community began to suspect a 67 year old man. 
He was called Finn Peterson. And neighbours on the night of Emily's disappearance heard strange noises coming from his house. And they thought that he might have been keeping Emily in there. They searched his house, however, searches didn't lead to anything. They never found any information tying him in with Emily. But they continued to keep coming back and researching Finn's house. In total, they searched his house five times. And I do believe he actually did try to claim some compensation for this, saying that he was a victim of harassment. On the 17th of October, police confirmed that they had arrested a 33-year-old man in relation to the case. He was a truck driver and he was arrested in August. They sent officers around to his house to search it. They checked his electronics, his GPS locations, and of course his alibi, which found that he also had nothing to do with a disappearance and that it was thought he had been charged kind of off a member of the public's information and due to something in his past. Interestingly though, this man would actually be arrested in 2019 for rape, but police have not commented as to whether they have any more information. So the police really, really did extensive searches and they had all of these tips that just really didn't lead anywhere. It actually was the most extensive volunteer search in Danish history with hundreds of hundreds of people turning up to find this woman. There are these tips coming in, these sightings of this white van and a white Hyundai car. These were seen immediately after Emily's disappearance. They were thought to be of high significance to the case. The Hyundai was spotted parked outside of the train stop at 4.07am and on the 10th of July a witness came forward to say that they had seen a similar car in the area later that day. Although all these things were coming in it didn't lead to an arrest. Police were kind of looking into three main theories. One, simply she'd taken off because she was upset. Two, that she'd had an accident. On her way home on the route she would have normally taken she would have had to go past a canal. Possibly she accidentally slipped and fell in. Thirdly was that she was a victim of a crime. Although there was all these people looking for Emily, unfortunately there is always some people who wouldn't ever want to offer help or search, like help in the search efforts. And they were kind of prominent on this Facebook group, Offensimentum Facebook group, which became notorious in Denmark for the content that it shared. Despite best efforts of the admin team, who were very outnumbered, uh, 15 to 42,000 followers, the group did become filled with these memes and jokes, all at the expense of Emily, with her disappearance being widely mocked, which is just utterly horrific, utterly unacceptable. It's just so childish and inappropriate, and I really don't understand why anyone would even do that. This poor girl was missing, nobody knew what had happened to her, and people were mocking it, and it's just horrific and so wrong. They were becoming desperate and they kind of set up this sort of anonymous line that people could ring in with any information and still be come, stay anonymous. Like I said, they had offered the reward of 2,000 kroner for any details that they could receive over Emily. Emily's details were passed on around the police stations as police suspect speculated that maybe she had travelled abroad or even been abducted and taken across the border to Germany. With no information, very little to go on and nothing coming of anything, I guess they believed that Emily Meng would just kind of be added to the list of missing women in Denmark that we have never found out what happened to them. That was until Christmas Eve when a body was discovered. At around 4pm, a passerby was walking his dog in like this forest area of Re Regiments back near Barup. He discovered a body. It had been submerged in a lake and it was confirmed on Christmas Day of all days to be the body of Emily Meng. It was later revealed that she had been violently murdered and dumped in the lake shortly after she actually went missing. And this lake was around 40 miles from her home. The discovery of the broad body bought brought forward 250 new leads, but they also didn't go anywhere. The police still really thought that these white vehicles that were spotted kind of around the time of her going missing were very vital to the case. Police scoured the lake for any forensic evidence that might have led them to Emily's killer, but there was none. After finding her body, the Meng family donated the reward that they put up for Emily's safe return to charity. A torch-lit procession of remembrance was held for Emily in Causa before she was buried on the 19th of January in 2017 at St Paul's Church, which was the church in which she, which she used to sing in the choir. As you may be aware, I've not told you the cause of Emily's death and that's because we don't know. The police never revealed it. 
they're keeping their kind of cards very close to the chest on that one and it's totally understandable they may have some information that if they let out there may kind of be detrimental to their case and so they're keeping it all stumped the only hint of a development in the case was when a witness saw somebody lifting a heavy object out of a white car and dumping it in the lake close to where the body was discovered. We don't know, however, if this information had any significance to a case or not. In January of 2019, the police began putting out DNA tests of everyone in Emily's own neighbourhood, perhaps suggesting a new theory has taken hold in the case and it's a lot closer to home than they initially thought. In the same year, a 42-year-old man was arrested in connection to the murder. This man owned a white Hyundai, which was obviously one of the cars that they were sure was involved in the case. This man was already in police custody for two of the murders, both being elderly men. The, this man had confessed to killing 68-year-old Kane Anderson in April and 80-year-old Powell Frank in June. However, both murders are very, very different to Emily Meng both being stabbed to death in their own homes and then them being burnt down. The only kind of tie was that one of the victims was actually taken from his home and thrown in the lake. This man would be later dismissed from police inquiries with regards to Emily Meng. There was also this theory that Emily Meng was linked to the so-called submarine killer, Peter Marsden, because of similarities in the way which he murdered Kim Wall. And he also drove a white car during the time of her abduction. I don't know what more came of this though, I couldn't find any more information on it, but it seems that maybe the links were just suspicion. Please possibly haven't delved any deeper into it. If you have some more information on that, please let me know in the comments below. After four years of the police keeping all this information close to the chest, it's hard to know if they're like any closer to a breakthrough in this case. They haven't really said very much since they found her body, but with them doing these DNA tests locally could suggest that a profile of the killer has been found somewhere, that a DNA sample has been found somewhere, and the police may not, may not believe that her murder was this random kidnapping and murder. Maybe the police are onto something and it could just be a matter of time before this person is actually caught, I just don't know. What I do know is that this case continues to be one that promotes these strong emotions in Denmark with many people questioning if the police have the right amount of training or support to deal with such issues and whether Denmark's strict laws on surveillance are suitable for modern times. While all this goes on, the harrowing thing still remains that a killer could still be out there. And I say could because this person, anything could have happened to them, they could have died, they could even be in jail or anything like that since the murder, we just don't know. I do believe that they are still out there though. I guess it's just something I want to believe because you want to believe that they're still out there and that they haven't passed away so that eventually they may be caught and they are going to serve justice for what they've done. Whether the attack was random or calculated, justice hasn't really, really been served for Emily and we still don't know what happened to her. Who did it or even why they did it. We also don't know if the pe person is still out there due to police failings or if it's just that this murderer is very good at hiding the track which is obviously a scary thought. My heart goes out to her friends and family and I truly do hope that one day we find out what happened to Emily. But for now, unfortunately, the case of Emily Menk still remains unsolved. So yeah, that's the end of the case. If you've got any suggestions you'd like me to look into, please do let me know and I'll look into them for you. If you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for similar content. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of Emily Menk. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, Bye. I just wanted to add on that for those of you who do celebrate Christmas, I hope you truly enjoy and be thankful for what you have with your family. Friends, good health, things like that. I am lucky enough to be spending tomorrow with my family, but I'm all too aware that not everyone is as lucky and not everyone has the option, which is tragic and sad, especially with cases like this when the loved ones have been taken away from them by some cruel person. I hope that making videos like this can shed light on that and possibly make people think a bit more and maybe we'll all be a bit more thankful for what we have. But yeah, Merry Christmas guys and please 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 stay safe over the holidays.